Portugal, the late Middle Ages. The year is 1383, and good old King Fernando I is dead. But that's okay. Kings die and their sons replace them. That is just a tiny issue. You see, Fernando only had one child, Princess Beatriz, who is married to King Juan I of Castile. Oh, now that's a problem. If Beatriz inherits the throne of Portugal, then that would effectively make Juan and his dynasty the rulers of both Portugal and Castile. A union between the two states with Castile as the senior partner could be seen from miles away. With the king's death, his wife became the regent for Beatriz and Juan. However, even though the deceased king had enjoyed the love of his people, his widow was very much hated across all the estates. Her lover, Count João Fernandes de Andeiro, was very much involved in the affairs of ruling the state in favor of the Castilians, and all this hate felt could really be a huge piece of foreshadowing. The Portuguese nobles found good claimants in the hands of João de Castro and João Master of Avis, both of brothers of King Fernando with the same name. As King Juan managed to arrest João de Castro, the resistance was set around João Master of Avis. In December, he and a group of conspirators gathered the people and stormed the royal palace in Lisbon, brutally stabbing the count to death. This was the beginning of the revolution. João de Viz was on the 16th proclaimed the regent and defender of the kingdom, and the people were so rallied in his cause that he even threw the bishop out of the Sea of Lisbon. During the last days of December, a young knight and commander by the name of Nuno Álvares Pereira managed to take St. George Castle and was then given the command of over a thousand men to defend Alentejo from any Castilian incursion. On the 16th of April, as a punitive expedition sent by King Juan I was besieging Fronteira, Nuno Álvares moved on with a force of 1400 men to give battle to the enemy 5000 men strong army. The Portuguese chose very wisely the terrain near Atoleiros and prepared for the devastating Castilian attack. The Castilians launched a full-on cavalry charge with 2,000 horsemen against the Portuguese formation, which held their ground. While the Portuguese suffered zero losses, the Castilians suffered heavy losses and were forced to retreat, with Nuno Alvarez in the pursuit. The Battle of Atleiros was a big blow on King Juan's ambitions, however it was not a crippling one. Wanting to avoid any distractions, the king went straight for the art of Portugal, its capital, Lisbon, laying her to siege on the 29th of May. João of Avis led the defense by himself, while Nuno Alvarez gathered strength outside for a possible counterattack and harassed the enemy supply lines using guerrilla tactics. Guerrilla warfare, baby! During July, a Portuguese fleet led by Rui Pereira, the uncle of Nuno Alvarez Pereira, sailed from Porto with supplies and men to reinforce Lisbon, managing to break through the Castilian's fleet to reinforce the city's garrison. The naval engagement cost the life of Rui Pereira, however it reinvigorated the people's spirits, and they kept on resisting until eventually, on the 3rd of September, King Juan was forced to leave the siege and retreat due to an outbreak of the plague in his camp. During March of the following year, João de Vich supporters summoned the courts to Coimbra to discuss the future of the Portuguese crown. The possibilities were either the Castilian faction, the Avis faction or the Castro faction, half brothers of King Fernando and John of Avis, all sons of King Pedro. Led by João das Regras, another John, the Avis faction wins over and in April João de Vich becomes King of Portugal and first of the new Avis dynasty. One of its first royal edicts is to make Nuno Alvarez the constable of the kingdom, and they both settle towards the reconquest of Minho, which they accomplish in only two months. Meanwhile, on the other side of the border, King Juan hasn't yet given up on the Portuguese throne. However, he is still assembling a new army and cannot afford to launch a major invasion right away as a response to the João de Viz being proclaimed as the King of Portugal, so the king orders a punitive expedition in the north. His 600 strong army pillages all the way to Viseu, looting and burning the city. However, 
They were intercepted on their way back by the mayor of Trancoso, near the chapel of Trancoso, with the composition of both his men and other nearby castle mayors, a force of about half the Castilian army. The battle was a great success, as the Portuguese nobles managed to get back the Castilian plunder and relieve its prisoners, while killing quite a few Castilian commanders, which would, in the long term, prove fatal. Realizing relatively small incursions won't break the Portuguese morale, Juan I commands himself over 32,000 men, including some 2,000 French heavy knights, marching towards Lisbon. As soon as the news of a new Castilian army assembling were delivered, the Portuguese summoned the military council to a branch, where they most likely freaked out. Some even suggesting that the only way they could hope to win was by staging a diversionary attack towards Sevilla. Eventually, the constable got tired of sitting still and took his men to Tumar, where he sent word to the king he would be waiting for him there. After finally deciding to intercept the enemy on its way to Lisbon, the king and his constable set camp at a small town near Leiria called Aljubarrota, which was soon to be the place of one of the most important battles in all history. The Portuguese army arrived on the first hours of the 14th of August and carefully prepared the terrain and formations. Nuno Alvarez had learned a lot with the English longbowmen in Portugal and he was ready to adapt their tactics in Crecy and Poitiers to defeat the Castilians in Bannockburn fashion. They took positions on a hill facing the road through which the Castilians would arrive, being protected on both sides from some small rivers and some minor elevations. However, as King Juan I approached from the road, he did not engage. Under the massive summer heat of mid-August, he instead decided to move from the rear of the Portuguese force in order to bypass the already battle-prepared Avish forces. What he at that time could not understand is that Nuno Alvarez Pereira had predicted that move. And just like a game of chess, the pieces were setting in. The Castilian army was big and slow, and as a result of that, when they finally arrived at the southern approach, the smaller and more maneuverable Portuguese army was already standing and waiting for them, this time in a field prepared with ditches, pits and caltrops. Juan I looked towards the Portuguese formation. On the other side, Nuno Alvarez watched his foe. The future of Portugal will be decided on that field. With the range units on his flanks, he himself commanding the vanguard and his king on the rear, he addresses his men for what can possibly be his last time. The French cavalry charges in, supported by its Castilian counterparts. Even before getting closer to the enemy, they already struggle with the shape of the land that funnels in as they advance, pushing them into one another and breaking formations. Then one by one start falling victims to the laid down traps, as English bowmen were in hell from above. The shock of the charge is neutralized, and with the bulk of the Castilian army lagging behind, most of them perish on the battlefield. The Castilian infantry also struggles to move. There are so many lines of them that they squeeze into one another, and there is so much lack of space that even the noblemen need to dismount. Seeing all hell was soon to let loose, King João of Portugal stepped in with his rear guards on the center, with Nuno's vanguard breaking into two to cover their flanks while the range units fell back. The fighting was incredibly brutal, especially on the flanks, with both sides suffering heavy losses. However, the Castilian position were unsustainable, with arrows and bolts flying in, being pushed into one another and stepping over pits and the body of their fallen comrades, morale soon broke. Then, when the Portuguese took over the Castilian banner, believing their king was dead, the Castilians disengaged and went on a disorganized retreat, with Juan I abandoning many of his dismounted noblemen, in an effort to escape the Portuguese chase. According to the legend, some soldiers tried to hide in a bread oven, only to be brutally killed by a crazy baker, Brich de Almeida, which soon became the symbol of Portuguese resistance and defiance. Having lost fewer than a thousand men, the Portuguese managed to inflict on the field some 5,000 losses, with another 5,000 on the aftermath. This effectively broke Castile, which could no longer afford to rally up a new army to conquer Portugal. King Fernando was dead from two years now, 
and finally Lisbon was safe. However, the fight was not over. There was still a war, and now it was time to bring the fight to their land. The Constable took over an army of 3,000 and marched towards Valverde, attempting to cross the Guadiana while being opposed by an army of 20,000 men. Nuno split his forces into the shores of the river, rear guard on one side, vanguard on the other. They were clearly overwhelmed, and the situation was looking bad. According to legend, Nuno disappeared for a moment, and was found silently praying. When one of his knights tried to warn him about the ongoing battle, Nuno asked for silence and finished his prayers, then returned reinvigorated to the battle, leading his men on the front and urging them to resist. Then he saw a gap and took it. Taking advantage of the Castilians finally getting out of projectiles, Nuno fought with his rear guard till reaching the banner of the Master of Santiago. After a brief duel, the Master fell to his sword and the capture of the banner caused the Castilians to break and retreat. This was the last battle Nuno ever fought like this in open terrain. But that was pretty much because the Castilians simply refused to ever engage with him again. Eventually peace was settled, and that marked the new beginning for Portugal. King João I of Portugal would cement ties with England and kickstart Portuguese maritime expansion, which would in a few decades turn Portugal into the first global empire. It is pretty much safe to say that without Algebarrota that would have never happened. The achievements of the Avis dynasty and its contributions to the world is immeasurable, and all of that could have never had happened if it wasn't for a hot summer day in the middle of August. As to our hero, Nuno Alves Pereira, he took part on the conquest of Ceuta, the first Portuguese town in Africa, and then gave away all of his belongings to veterans, keep in mind he was owner of almost half of Portugal, and joined the monastery as Nuno of Saint Mary, where he would eventually die in 431, surrounded by his closest friend, João de Viz, the King of Portugal, at 71 years of age. Always true to his people, when in 425 rumors spread about the Muslims preparing to attack Ceuta, he declared himself ready to go on an expedition to relieve the city, despite his old age. Nuno Alvar's tomb was sadly lost during the Lisbon earthquake, and its epitaph read Here lies that famous Nuno, the constable, founder of the House of Bragança, excellent general, blessed monk, who during his life on earth so ardently desired the kingdom of heaven, that after his death, he merited the eternal company of the saints. His worldly honors were countless, but he turned his back on them. He was a great prince, but he made himself a humble monk. He founded, built, and endowed this church where his body now remains. Viva Portugal!